Keith Goslin. I am a marketing professor at CSUN, and today I'm going to be talking about building brands, not commodities. All of the information that you need to know about this recording is contained in the description of this video. So building brands, not com commodities is one of my favorite, most favorite uh, subjects to talk about in marketing because the difference between building a brand and a commodity is the difference between great marketing and not very good marketing. What do we mean by a commodity, however? Commodity can mean a lot of different things in a lot, a lot of different fields. In marketing, however, it has a specific use, a specific meaning. What it is talking about can be seen by this graphic here. This is actually my favorite graphic in all of marketing, even though it's very ugly, I understand that. And in marketing, we're usually about beauty and aesthetics and fluff. But in this case, it's very, it communicates a lot of information very easily and very powerful information. A commodity is something that uh, is, is what we don't want to become and it's represented by the inner part of the circle. The inner part of the circle is referring to a product as something that we do. It's the product category. So for instance, I'm gonna use milk as one of my examples. Milk is a beverage. Milk satisfies your need for calcium and it builds strong bones. That's what it is, that's what it does. It's a beverage and it satisfies your thirst. And when people think of milk, that's what they think of. They think of the category milk. What they don't usually think about, most people, is a brand of milk. And there's a very big difference between that. So why is this bad? It's bad if you are a commodity, if you're just simply milk, because then people are buying and judging the product by your price. Because in theory, all milk is the same. So if somebody's going to the grocery store and, they, and you need more milk, you'll call out to them, hey, don't forget the milk, right? But you don't say something like, don't forget the Jersey Maid. Hey, don't forget the Lucerne. Don't forget the Knudsen. People don't say that. The reason they don't say that is because they don't think of a brand. Why? Because they don't care what brand of milk you bring back. All they know is they want you to bring back fat-free milk or low-fat milk or 1% milk or 2% milk, whatever milk you buy, that's the category of product that they want. So they go to the milk aisle, they see all this milk right here, and what do they do next? Well, they look at the prices. They look at all the 1% milk, let's say that you want 1% milk. They look at all the 1% milk and they look at the prices, $1.98, $1.97, $1.96, and which one do they buy? They buy the $1.96. Why? Because milk is milk is milk. It's all the same. That's a commodity. You're looking at the category of the product. You're not looking at the brand. And that's a disaster for us as marketers because if we want to increase our sales, let's say that I'm the $1.98 milk and I'm losing all my sales to the $1.96 milk because that's the cheapest one. The only way to increase my sales is to drop my price. So I drop my price to $1.95. This is good. All my sales are going up. I'm happy now. Unfortunately, my competitor's not happy, so what do they do? They drop their price to $1.94. People show up, they're buying theirs now. I gotta drop my price, they gotta drop their price. What we have now is we have a price war. A price war is where brands are using their price to win the battle. And that is the worst situation to be in. What we wanna do is try to market our product beyond just what we do. Because if that's what we limit it to, people are left with just judging us by the price, okay? So, what is a brand? I'm gonna say that we need to build a brand, but what do I mean by that? Well, going back to this same graphic, this was the commodity, but this is the brand. The bigger circle, the, uh, the, more, uh, the, the, the larger circle represents the value that you now offer beyond what you do. Right? So when I build a brand, all of these things along the circle here, country of origin, brand personality, user imagery, or the one I'm gonna talk about here, emotional benefits, each one of these is what we call non functional value. It's value that doesn't exist. 
We put into the minds by great marketing, brilliant marketing, we get people to believe that they have emotional benefits that they get from my brand. And so they value it higher. They're more willing to spend more money for my brand because they get emotional benefits. Now, what do I mean by this? I'm going to uh, talk about that on the next slide when I talk about Starbucks. But why is this good? It's good because now, when I wanna stimulate sales, I don't have to just drop my price. I don't have to worry just about price. I can try to provide some form of non-functional value, value that actually doesn't exist, but people feel like they're getting from my product versus the competition. Now, here in the United States, we have a brand called Horizon Milk. Horizon is actually a very popular brand. So when somebody is going to the market and they want Horizon, they won't say don't, they won't say go get milk. They'll say get the Horizon. Don't forget the Horizon. Because Horizon has broken away in the milk category and created a brand. What kind of brand do they have? Well, Horizon Milk is considered organic. It's considered higher quality. It's considered better for you. Now, is it better for you? I don't know. But through brilliant marketing, they've made people feel like, I want the Horizon, not the other milk. So when they go to the store and they're looking at all the milks and they want organic milk, they don't look, all, they don't look at all the organic milks the same. They see Horizon and they consider it better. And so there's this perception of superiority for their brand. That's a good thing. Because while the other milks are fighting over price, Horizon keeps their price. They don't have to drop their price. They have brand loyalists, people who will buy their brand no matter what. So that's what we want to achieve as marketers. We want to create a brand. And the way to do it is by coming up with non-functional value. And, and this is not a comprehensive list, but these are the kinds of things that we could do. Now, I don't want to make it sound easy because doing great things in marketing requires great marketing efforts, intelligence, doing things very difficult. So I'm going to show you on, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, show you on the next slide uh, about how Starbucks does this so that they're not judged simply by the coffee that they sell. All right. So let's talk a little bit about Starbucks. I'm hoping you all know Starbucks. It's a very popular U.S. brand as well as international brand. I think you've probably gone to Starbucks, most likely wherever you are. And Starbucks, uh, people who go to Starbucks pay a premium price for coffee, right? So first of all, what is Starbucks? Starbucks is not coffee. It never was, it never will be. In fact, when they changed their logo four years ago, it used to say Starbucks coffee. They took it off. This is their logo right now. They removed Starbucks because everybody knows who this is. This is Starbucks, right? They don't have to say it, they know it. And they got rid of coffee because they never were about the coffee. They're about the coffee experience. Coffee, like several other kinds of products, is very what we call multi-sensorial. It actually, when you consume coffee, it affects uh, all the senses. Okay, and I'm going to show you what that means. But what Starbucks did is they created emotional benefits associated with the coffee experience that you get at a Starbucks. And that elevated them to become a brand and not just another place to get coffee. People go to Starbucks on purpose. So when somebody says, hey, you want to meet for coffee, they don't just think of a coffee place. If they want Starbucks, they'll say, hey, you want to meet at Starbucks? Everybody knows what that means. Let's all go to Starbucks, right? So how do they do this? All right. They do it through the five senses, all right? The first one is sight. When you walk into a Starbucks, they have a very particular aesthetics, a very particular look and feel. You can see it's very oaky. It's very uh, comforting. It's a little bit like a second home. And that's exactly what they want you to feel. They want you to, when you walk into a Starbucks, you want to feel very uh, like you're you're um, you're, you're almost in a, your second home and you're you're almost in your living room and you're going to consume coffee with either by yourself or with somebody else. So the visuals are very important. In a Starbucks, they oftentimes have pictures of the local city. So we have one here in Northridge. 
So when you go into that Northridge, you'll see that, that Starbucks, you'll see pictures of old Northridge, pictures from 80 years ago of Northridge, very, uh, very local, right? But they also have pictures of Ethiopia and of Nigeria and of Colombia. Why do they do that? That's because they want you to have a certain kind of feeling when you walk into it and you see local pictures intermixed with global pictures. We call that global. They're trying to give you a feel that Starbucks is your place, local, but it's also globally minded. They're trying to get that sense of a community, a certain kind of community feel through sight. All right, what's the second one? Sound. When you go into a Starbucks, what do you hear? John, Sue, Steve, first names. Not Mr. Goslin, Mr. Smith, Ms. Knight. You know, we don't, they don't say that. They say first names. So as soon as you walk in, what do you hear? You hear familiarity. Everybody knows everybody. They're all good friends. Are they really good friends? Not really, but it sounds like it, right? And that's all they care about. When you go into a Starbucks, they're trying to make you feel like you're with people that you want to be with. Your friends, associates, people like you. So again, they're building this sense of a particular kind of community shared experience. The third one is taste. And this is actually uh, pretty brilliant of Starbucks. They do a lot of brilliant things. And this is brilliant because it frustrates me because I'm not a really big Starbucks fan. Of course, I'm a marketer. But uh, when you go into Starbucks, if you order your coffee uh, with two shots, extra foam, non-fat milk, right? You give that whole long order and then they give it to you and you watch people, they taste it and they, they kind of like go like this. And say, that, that's not right. You forgot my extra shot or that's not non-fat milk. And they hand it back to the barista. What does the barista do? They apologize. They dump it out. They make one from scratch until they get it right. Because here's the thing about the coffee experience. Coffee is not really about taste. One thing we learn in marketing is beverages are not marketed on taste. Food is not marketed on taste. Taste is subjective. You know what tastes good to people? Consistent taste. So if I drink Coca-Cola, I love Coca-Cola, the moment I taste one and it wasn't made right, I'll know it immediately. It has to taste the same way every time. Coca-Cola doesn't taste good. Starbucks doesn't taste good. There's no such thing. It's consistent. And Starbucks knew that. So if they make it a little bit wrong, they're going to dump it out and give it to you until it tastes exactly the way you want it to. That's not good or bad. It's just consistent. And it goes with everything else they're doing here. A sense of consistency. A friend will remake your coffee. They don't give you a hard time. They just dump it out. They give it to you until they get it right. Because that's what friends do. Right? They're building the sense of community through sight, sound, taste, and then touch. Coffee is very uh, multi-central, and one of the things is touch. Uh, you can have a very hot coffee on a cold day, which we don't seem to get out here in Los Angeles very often, but on a cold day when you have a nice hot, hot cup of coffee, it's almost having like your little own fireplace. You watch people when they're leaving a Starbucks on a cold day and they have their hot coffee, they have it right near their chest, and they're kind of letting the heat keep them warm and they have their hands on the coffee. It's like your own little fireplace. It's very, uh, it's very touch oriented or on a very hot day, which we're having here in Northridge right now, you're gonna have, it's like your own little refrigerator. You have your iced coffee and it's very cold. Yeah, and so what you do is you're walking outside the Starbucks. What do you see people do with it? They wipe it across their forehead. Your coffee now is a way of keeping cool, right? It's very touch. And it's a touch that you're very familiar with. So again, all of these things, all four of these, are all trying to appeal to your senses to create this experience and evoke emotions, consistency, community, um, you know, a familiarity. And by the way, here in America, these are very important things. We live in a world that has no consistency, very little community. So if you want to get away from the world and get to a nice little place to enjoy yourself, Starbucks can be a getaway, right? But what about the last one, smell? Does smell really matter? Actually, yes. In fact, Starbucks found out that the smell that you smell when you come into a Starbucks is incredibly important. Why? Because 
about 12 years ago, they got a new competitor. Somebody else got in the coffee business, and that, that company was McDonald's. McDonald's started to offer frappuccinos, lattes, all kinds of different coffee drinks. They used to just sell black coffee, but then they said, we're gonna come out with a coffee line. And here's why McDonald's did it. They know that people go to McDonald's to get breakfast sandwiches. Why not sell them coffee at the same time? And it was brilliant. People were going into McDonald's, they were getting their breakfast sandwiches, they were getting coffee, they were selling a lot of these. But what happened to Starbucks? Well, Starbucks eventually started to see that sales were going down. So they made a very bad assumption. They thought they were losing business because people were buying their coffee from McDonald's and they weren't buying it from Starbucks. That isn't what was going on. What was going on is Starbucks, when Mark McDonald's started to sell the coffee, Starbucks did something. They introduced breakfast sandwiches. So Starbucks said, hey, McDonald's, if you're gonna get into the coffee business, well, we're gonna get into the breakfast business. So what happened next? Good news for Starbucks, they started selling these. They were selling off the shelf. They couldn't keep up with demand. Everybody wanted a breakfast sandwich and a Starbucks coffee. That's good news, right? But the weird thing is, after several months, the traffic started to go down at most Starbucks. So bad that they were closing more Starbucks than they were opening. It was a bad situation and they couldn't figure out. People love the sandwiches. Why are they not coming here? They got desperate. So they called up the founder, the person who really uh, you know, started uh, Starbucks, took it national, took it international, asked them to come back and be the CEO again. Can you please help us? We can't figure this out. The CEO came into his first Starbucks in years, hadn't been to a Starbucks in years, walked in, and as the story goes, did this. Kind of looked around, walked out, went to his office, typed up a memo, sent it out to every Starbucks, and the memo said, stop promoting the breakfast sandwiches. That's all he said. He didn't say stop selling them. He didn't stop and he didn't say to stop the product line. He said, stop promoting them. And he also said, move the oven to the other side away from the door. Why did he say this? Here's what happened. He walked in, he smelled, and what he saw was Starbucks, what he heard was Starbucks, what he tasted was Starbucks, and what he felt was all Starbucks. But what he didn't smell was Starbucks. You know what he smelled? He smelled McDonald's. He smelled egg, bacon, sausage, and guess what? People stopped going to Starbucks as much as they used to simply because something was different. Something was wrong. Nobody complained. Nobody went to the manager and said, hey, it just smells like McDonald's in here. Nobody said that. Nobody said, hey, it smells like egg. Something was different to the Starbucks experience and they couldn't put their finger on it, but they didn't like it anymore. They stopped going. So what happened next? They stopped promoting them. They moved the oven away. The smell got less. It became coffee smell, not egg and sausage and bacon. And the people started coming back. So the reason I use this as my example is to show you how important every element working together to try to create something that doesn't exist. Does community exist in Starbucks? Not really but can people feel a sense of community, a sense of consistency, familiarity, friendship? Can they feel that from a brand? Yes, if it's done well. If it's not done well, well, like I said, Starbucks started to have a problem with, uh, with uh, volume of business and they started going out of business. So that's the difference between a commodity and a brand. I hope that uh, really uh, makes it clear, but I, I do wanna emphasize one thing. I'm simplifying it. What I'm talking about here is very difficult to do. Building a brand takes a lot of time, takes great marketing and a lot of effort. So now if you can complete all the steps in the, the process for, the, for this uh, course, you'll get your certificate. And then please be aware that we have a lot of other programs, great programs at IBS. I teach the communications seminar here, but we have several other seminars as well. Uh, please look into them. And we look forward to seeing you here at Northridge someday in one of our classes and hopefully in mine. Thank you very much for your time.